SoCal Connected is made possible through the generous support of the Amundsen Foundation, serving the Los Angeles community since 1952. On tonight's SoCal Connected, what's happening to the local news? I'm the only reporter I know of who still has a job. January was probably the craziest month in the history of the LA Times. How bad is the state of local news in LA? In a word, dreadful. It's a great time to be a corrupt politician because who's watching? seemed unimaginable. No newspapers, but the presses are slowing down in cities and towns across the nation. What happens when the papers go away and the questions stop being asked? I was laid off in August of 1995. I was let go in 1998. I was laid off in 2006. I was laid off in 2010. I was terminated in 2011. These former employees are taking a final look at the Los Angeles Times before it relocates. It's a farewell tour, years in the making. I was here 39 years making newspapers, and uh, it got kind of bad after the Tribune Company bought us. A lot of little things changing, cutting back here, cutting back there. Once upon a time, the Los Angeles Times was a big, award-winning, powerful voice in the Southland. It boasted one of the largest newsrooms in the world. It was proudly owned by the Chandler family for generations. But in 2000, they sold it to the Tribune Company. In 2016, Tribune splintered and it was spun into a new entity. The paper has endured its share of cutbacks in the past 18 years, shrinking the newsroom from 1,200 to a little more than 400. But the past year has been particularly rough at the LA Times. And the paper is far from alone when it comes to weathering recent storms. A lot of things have changed lately about media in Southern California. And I can't think of any of them that were, I would say, were changes for the better. This year in journalism, in print journalism, has been extraordinary. It was one of those years where you almost want to forget, like you just want to have a drink and just go, can we just move on to the next one? In August 2017, the Los Angeles Times got a new publisher, Ross Levinson. The paper was still getting used to its new company name, created by Tribune's CEO, Michael Farrell. He decided to name our company Tronk. Tronk. Which was so, I don't, lowercase T-R-O-N-C, Tribune, do you remember what it is? I mean, let me put it this way, you never want to be the subject of a John Oliver sketch. Tronk, which sounds like the noise an ejaculating elephant makes. <laughs> or, or more appropriately, the sound of a stack of print newspapers being thrown into a dumpster. The fall of 2017, uh, Tronk brings in its own team of a, of a publisher and an editor. The editor's name is Louis Dvorkin. We have um, created a highly scalable, highly efficient way to create quality content. He came in uh, with a mission to make the LA Times more in the image of what he saw an online news operation would be about. Journalism, marketing, and PR are converging. A lot of my colleagues would think that's blasphemy to say, but that's what's happening. And this was pretty much about maximizing profits and cutting costs. He also came in with a chip on his shoulder, uh, apparently about the people at the LA Times. He felt that they were not uh, open enough to innovation. He just pushed all the wrong buttons. Plus, Dvorkin almost immediately stepped into a big controversy. Two weeks earlier, 
The L.A. Times had published an investigation into Disneyland's relationship with the city of Anaheim. It's the kind of story that the L.A. Times is put here to do. The story questioned the financial arrangements between the city and the amusement park. Disney did not like the story, and they put us into an editorial blackout where they didn't allow our critics to go see their movies during early screenings. Dvorkin called his first staff meeting. So in this first all-hands meeting, Louis Dvorkin tells the staff that this was just a minor media spat. Uh, and meanwhile, people were very angrily questioning him about why weren't we covering this as a news story. The meeting about the Disney story soon became its own story. A recording of that meeting was made by somebody on the staff. There was a question asked to me, did, did I make a concession? The answer is no. I listened to what they had to say. Orkin was very angry about it, and he held a second meeting. His tapes I obtained. Clearly, someone here is not playing by the rules of ethical behavior, as far as I'm concerned. And in that second meeting, uh, he suggested that his own staffers had been unethical, had been immoral. And frankly, I think it showed a degree that whoever was involved was morally bankrupt. I remember catching the eye of a couple of people we looked at one another like, is he really saying this? And then he said that they probably, whoever had shared that audio with other news organizations had probably broken California state law. Of course, he's talking to reporters who already uh, know the law very well and are uh, very in tune with uh, how to report on something, how to record something. Sometime after that meeting, one of our terrific editors, Kimi Yoshino, was walked from her desk abruptly out of the building. And the sense was that they believed that she was the source of the leaked recording from the first meeting. There was a fundamental lack of trust in the people running uh, the newspaper and the people running the newsroom. Nobody knew you know, if the company was monitoring their communications. They didn't know who was going to be suspended next. People had bought burner phones um, because they thought the company was spying on them. This was ham-handed. It was an ugly episode that didn't have to happen that way. Apart from when the LA Times was actually bombed, January was probably the craziest month in the history of the LA Times. Trunk announced the LA Times would move. Louis Dvorkin was removed from the paper. He was the third executive editor in just six months. And it was about to get more chaotic. The newsroom voted to unionize. And it's successful. It's not successful by a hair or by a solid margin. It is overwhelming. And that is the moment at which Trunk decides it's not clear it wants the paper any more. Enter the savior. I got a call on Thursday. And the statement was, look, we are serious. Here's the price. And they said, well, we have to make a decision by Monday because um, 20 to 30 percent of the staff will be let go. Uh, the uh, Washington Bureau will probably be shut down. We're moving. We definitely made the decision. We're moving out of the downtown to Playa Vista for a $90 million um, lease. And if you want to change that, you have to make a decision by Monday. And by Sunday um, afternoon, morning, basically, we, we had penned an agreement. Dr. Patrick Soon Xiang, a billionaire doctor and one of LA's wealthiest residents, had just agreed to pay over $500 million for his hometown paper. It was really tumultuous but important because I thought this was, it was now or never, and if we didn't do it, who would? Jeff Bezos, who is wealthier than even Patrick Soon Xiang, he bought the Washington Post for about half of what Soon Xiang paid. So it wasn't about the money. We clearly overpaid. I, 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 I recognize that. Before the deal even closed, Dr. Sun Xiang met with a shell-shocked staff. I wanted to assure them that the reason we bought this was not a vanity or philanthropic exercise. It was very much a commitment to the city, to the paper, to democracy, and a commitment to journalism. Patrick Sun Xiang came in, Dr. Sun Xiang, and it was like an action movie being helicoptered off the roof of the building as it's crumbling beneath you. There was that sense of how close we came to 
a, a very destructive scenario. When the opportunity arose for me to take over the Los Angeles Times, I uh, was really almost like a godsend uh, because I saw that if somebody didn't do something, uh, the destruction of this paper and local news is so important. Um, it's important truly, I don't mean it just as a word uh, for the democracy of this nation. The sort of scary thing through all this period was that, you know, apart from those news outlets on the East Coast that were writing about us, we felt a little lonely. There was a crisis happening at our newspaper, and who was going to tell our readers about it? Other news outlets were in chaos or just gone. In November, LA is shut down. Then, secretive new owners decimated the LA Weekly's newsroom. A month earlier, the OC Weekly lost its top editor. And delivery of East LA's oldest hometown paper was about to stop. So you'll see that these are when here. we used, if I remember correctly, six level tape. It's a regular column that we had East LA beyond and beyond. It was sort of a society page type of thing for the East Side. And Dolores Sanchez and her daughter Gloria Alvarez used to own a string of local newspapers covering Southeast oh, LA. These are photos. Years and years and years of sports photos, everything, community photos. The Gallatin. This is interesting because this is like a quinceanera that was in a predominantly African-American community. Our flagship newspaper started in 1945, so it published every Thursday since 1945. Our family bought the group of newspapers in 1979. We started, I believe, with six newspapers, at one point got up to 11. We were the largest bilingual newspaper in the country. They had papers covering nearly a dozen cities. They also had readers, plenty of them. We were free circulation. We went to their doors, so they didn't read the Times. They didn't need to read the Times. They didn't like the Times. They would read us. The Sanchez family lived in the area they covered. It wasn't just that it was an assignment for them. This was their community. And it's a big difference to just to tell a reporter, well, you go out to Boyle Heights and talk about the pollution or talk about the freeways or the congestion or the, the immigrant raids or whatever they're doing over there. They were the community. They had a great sensitivity for it. We understood the community's history. We knew what was going on. We knew, we knew the backstory. And they knew when they were on to something. One of our reporters picked up that someone in the community had told her that Everybody was getting sick around there. The, they had a cluster of cancers. So she went to research the chemicals, and we ran an article on it. The story ran on the front page. It raised questions about a battery plant in Vernon called Exide. People that I went to school with, after seeing me in the newspaper, be interviewed on the newspaper, seeing me in the news, seeing me at the meetings, I can't tell you how many people have said, hey, you know what, my mom died of cancer. My sister had cancer in her cheek. When residents could put a name to what was making them sick, to the company that was there, it became big. They kept reporting and publishing. One article led to 50, then 100. Often we called and said, hey, can you guys check this out? Can you, you know, research this for us? And then report back to us on what was going on. Now I don't have anybody to do that. In February, the last paper was published. Community newspapers and newspapers in general have not been high profit media outlets. Um, it's always been a struggle. They've always operated on tight margins. But when you start becoming these big corporate companies with stockholders and shareholders and you have to pay dividends and you have to pay all these other little people who have their fingers in, in the pie, it's, you're no longer paying reporters and journalists you're paying dividends to someone else. Uh, 
Uh, this was an award to the Copley Ring of Truth when Copley owned the paper. They used to give awards for good stories and uh, there were cash awards. This was when I helped solve a child molestation case and I identified the, the child molester. So I got this, uh, got my little bell. I have two, two bells from the Copley era. Larry Altman was a crime reporter at the Daily Breeze for 28 years. He was so popular, the paper put him on billboards around the South Bay. I was one of the 20 movers and shakers under 40 years old that were going places in journalism. Um, uh, and actually, I was just under 40 when they, I was like 39 and eight months or something like that. Um, they called us all into a meeting and they said, now we're gonna do layoffs. It was gonna be the photographers, we're gonna be in January. The news reporters were gonna be February. And then designers and copy editors in March. Layoffs are nothing new for the Daily Breeze. The paper won a Pulitzer, its first in 2015 for its reporting on alleged corruption at a local school district. When the day came that, you know, the, the Pulitzers were gonna be announced, they were all gone. The people that won the Pulitzer were gone. The Daily Breeze is part of a chain of newspapers from San Bernardino to Long Beach to Orange County that are all now owned by the same company. Collectively, they call themselves the Southern California News Group, but they're actually owned by a company called Digital First Media, which has newspapers all around the country, and they are controlled by a venture capital fund. Alden Global Capital is a hedge fund, or sometimes described as a vulture fund. You have to be weak and struggling for Alden to be interested. They invest in distress. Julie Reynolds was a reporter at the Monterey Herald when Digital First Media bought the paper. Soon, we didn't have hot water in our building. We had to buy our own office supplies. I had to buy manila folders and pens and a calendar. Um, it just got so we're like, I'm not volunteering at a local community group here. This is a corporate owned business. Reynolds left the Monterey Herald in 2015. She now investigates her former employer, the second largest newspaper owner in America. And this is really important for the American people because we like to know who owns our media. We expect to know who owns our hometown paper so that we can judge their biases and you know, their perspective, what, what their slant might be on our local news. If we have no idea who they are, then our news is just coming out of this vacuum. She works for the Communications Workers of America News Guild. The Guild helps news people unionize. It's not right that journalists don't investigate our own industry. We should have always been doing this, and I'm glad they're finally waking up and doing it now. The industry has taken its hits over the past couple of decades. Craigslist killed the classifieds by replacing once lucrative advertising. Mergers hurt other ad revenue. Facebook, Google, and BuzzFeed sucked up what was left. And many papers fought the transition to digital. I think newspapers have a certain amount of culpability in this whole equation because they made themselves vulnerable enough for a company like Alden to swoop in. The cuts have been particularly deep here in Southern California. 11 mastheads across Southern California that include the Daily Breeze and the LA Daily News and the Orange County Register, uh, their staff, their newsroom staff was cut by a third. And those kinds of cuts are not unique to Southern California. They've happened at the San Jose Mercury News, which is also owned by Alden Global Capital. They've happened at the East Bay Times. They've happened at the Denver Post. Those cuts helped push the company's profits sky high, according to leaked internal records. Digital first media papers are making 17% profit margins. At some of their papers, they're making as much as 30%. Frank Pine is the executive editor of the Southern California News Group. He lost a third of his editorial staff at the beginning of 2018. Every year there's less money, right? Print revenue is inevitably declining. If there are no cuts, you're gonna go out of business. And all cuts feel excessive. I don't know that I'm in the position to say 
what the company should or should not do because I'm not on the board and I'm not privy to all of the things that they think about when they're making decisions like that. I'm an editor and my job is to run the newsroom. They determine how much money I'm gonna get to do that, right? And, and I have to live with that. After a tough six months, Pine is hiring again, about three dozen positions. But that's not anywhere close to replacing the 100 workers lost earlier this year. Some laid off reporters like Tom Hofarth were hired back as daily hires. When you get laid off, you're asked to come back and do freelance for, you know, 75 bucks, 100 bucks, just to do the same story and maybe a little bit more. You get the same person, you get the same stories, you just get it at pennies on a dollar. Like a lot of reporters, Hofarth has been turned into just another gig worker. The cost cutting has helped make papers here profit centers. According to leaked financials, half of the company's profits in the last fiscal year came from the papers it owned in California. A paywall is also helping the bottom line, but cubicles remain empty. The spotlight is dimming on communities throughout the Southland. L.A. is a balkanized city. Lots of little villages all over the place. I mean, you can see a million different faces and a, all these different dialects, all these different communities in one city. And to cover that requires real shoe leather reporting and people who know that neighborhood. And we don't have that anymore. It's rare that we do have reporters in, in, in our city, and I think people are, are fed up with everything that's been happening in the city, and it's getting no attention. And anytime reporters are here, they're able to ask the questions and get the information and pass it out and disseminate it and get it out there to our community to inform them of everything that's been happening in our city. And when there's no reporters here, our story isn't being told. So I'm appalled that you have kids and you are proving this. Maywood is one of 88 cities in Los Angeles County. It sits along the so-called corridor of corruption in Southeast LA. Like many city council meetings, there's a lot being discussed. Pothole repairs, cannabis shops, real estate deals, but few, if any, journalists asking questions. It's a great time to be a corrupt politician because who's watching? Nobody's watching and we know they are out there. There was a study recently that in those cities that have lost their small newspapers, their bond interest rates, their city operating costs have gone up. The cost of these towns to taxpayers are going up because the newspapers are not there to say, look, you should not be doing this. I really do fear that people are not going to know what they need to know. Sometimes it's not just the little communities that get ignored. News from one of the most important parts of government also gets short shrift. This is the busiest federal courthouse in the nation with hundreds of filings, civil, bankruptcy, criminal, appellate, every day. Fred Schuster covers the federal courts for City News Service. And as you see, there is an enormous staff of journalists here to cover it. In actual fact, I'm the only reporter covering federal court in LA on a full-time basis. There's so much news being made in these government centers. There are civil rights cases going on every day. There are medical issues being litigated. There are interesting Ponzi schemes, which affect hundreds and hundreds of people. There are criminal cases involving doctors who are overprescribing and making a fortune from it. Many of them are being covered, but many are not. But Schuster thinks the current crisis in local reporting isn't just about layoffs. The public is being inundated with myths about fake news. If people are not here to cover real events that happen in real time to real people with documents to back them up, who can tell the difference anymore? Back at the LA Times, a billionaire doctor with a soft spot for the fourth estate rescued from a near-death experience. 
the paper relocated in El Segundo in July. It's incredibly exciting because we had to move maybe 700 people into a new building. And now I think the work begins where we create this whole new era. This time last year, few could have predicted the LA Times would be locally owned on a hiring spree and home to a unionized newsroom. But none of this is likely to happen to other news outlets. Help, however, may come in another form, partnerships. I don't see us as competition at all. I think uh, I see what we, we bring as something that we should actually, almost as a moral obligation, to actually share this kind of information out in the different outlets. Maybe they'll share with some recent digital startups, including those by former reporters at the LA Weekly and the Long Beach Press-Telegram. But they're not meant to replace the muscle of a daily newspaper. But they may have to. There are going to be major cities in this country without a daily newspaper the way we used to know it. And that is a terrible development. And I, I would love to say I'm wrong. I hope somebody proves me wrong. If we don't come up with a business model that supports them, I don't see how it's going to happen.